Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Hindustan Unilever Limited Conference Call for the results for December quarter 2022. As a reminder, all participants' lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star, then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. A. Ravi Shankar, Group Controller and Head of Investor Relations. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you, Aman. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the conference call of the San Lifted. Best wishes to all of you and your families for a wonderful 2023. We'll be covering this evening the results for the quarter ended 31st December 2022. On the call with me is Sanjeev Mehta, our CEO and Managing Director, and Ritesh Tiwari, our CFO. We'll start the presentation with Sanjeev sharing an overview of our performance in the quarter and the operating environment. Ritesh will then cover our financial results, outlook, and also cover the details of our new royalty arrangement. Before we get started with the presentation, I would like to draw your attention to the safe harbor statement included in the presentation for good order's sake. With that, over to you, Sanjeev. Hi, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining the call. My first uh, engagement with you this year, and I take this opportunity to wish all of you a fabulous new year with good health, success, and tons of happiness. Now, let me begin with a summary of our performance for the quarter, and then I'll talk about the external environment and our strategy. We have the momentum. We delivered yet another quarter of solid all-round performance. Our top line grew 16% with an underlying volume growth of 5%. EBITDA margin remained healthy at 23.6%, sequentially improving by 30 bips over the last quarter, led by a step up in gross margin. Our earnings per share grew 12%. We continue to significantly outperform the market with over 35% of our business winning both value and volume market shares. Sustainability remains core to our business, and I'm very happy to report that we have received industry-leading ratings when it comes to ESG. To sum up, in the last nine months of this fiscal, we have added more than 6,000 crores to our top line and reported a turnover in excess of 43,000 crores. Our net profit grew 14% to more than 7,400 crores. Our consistent, strong, all-round performance is a testament to our strategic clarity, strength of our brands, our capabilities, our execution progress, and agility to run the business. And most importantly, the determination and passion of our talented, purpose-driven people. Now, let me spend some time on the external environment, the inflationary situation, and the market growth. This year, the FMCG industry has witnessed unprecedented inflation across a wide basket of commodities led by supply-side issues. Lately, we have seen a few key commodities soften, notably palm oil. With this, the year-on-year -year inflation is moderating gradually from its peak. The consumer price inflation has also softened in recent months. Having said that, commodities remain at an elevated level when compared to long-term averages. This is evident when you look at inflation from a two-year lens. Commodities such as crude oil, soda ash, food ingredients are seeing close to 100% inflation when compared to the December quarter of 2020. The other, of course, the source of inflation has been the currency. U.S. dollar is appreciated by more than 10% versus rupee this year. Overall, if commodities remain where they are, we expect the inflationary pressure to moderate gradually, and this augurs well for our industry. Now, talking about FMCG market growth with reference to the categories we operate in, in December quarter, the market grew about 8% year-on-year, which was higher than the growth in September quarter. Benefit of higher festive sales was seen in September and October months, which grew at double digits. Growth continued to be price-led and volumes declined, although the decline in December quarter was lower than previous quarter. This December happened to be India's warmest in more than a century. Delayed onset and less severe winter adversely impacted the performance of categories such as hand and body care, facial moisturizers, and similar categories. 
Now, talking about FMCG market growth from urban and rural lens, urban markets have continued to lead the growth. Rural has shown some signs of improvement with December quarter growth higher than growth since September quarter and the last 12 months. If I were to summarize the last three slides, we can say that there is a gradual improvement in the FMCG operating environment. Commodity inflation seems to have peaked and is moderating from its unprecedented level. With lower inflation, strong winter crop sowing, and signs of pickup in farm incomes, it is likely that rural slowdown is bottoming out. The next few months will give us further certainty on this aspect. In this context, our strategy, of course, remains unchanged. One, we will continue to operate the business with agility and remain focused on growing our consumer franchise while protecting our business model. Secondly, we will continue single-mindedly on a journey to create a purpose-led future fit HUL and deliver on a 4G growth. And by now, I'm sure every one of you is conversant with this 4G growth mantra of consistent, competitive, profitable, and responsible. Now, we have always believed in doing business responsibly. In fact, we believe it is the only way of doing business. A shining example of this is Prabhat, a sustainable community development initiative, which we started in 2013. In the last nine years, Prabhat has made a positive difference to nearly 9 million people in the communities around a factory and depot locations. Be it through economic empowerment, environmental sustainability, or supporting health and nutrition. The great work done under Prabhat has also been recognized by the World Economic Forum. It also won the FIKI CSR Award for Skill Development. October 15th is observed as Global Hand Washing Day with the aim of increasing awareness of hand washing with soap, which is an effective way to prevent diseases and save lives, as we all saw during the pandemic. A purpose driven brand, Lifeboy, has been championing this cause for several decades. Building on its impact created so far and amplifying it further, Lifeboy has partnered with children as young change makers to take on the mantle of H for hand washing, chief education officers, the CEOs. Over the years, Lifeboy has reached 500 million people in India, educating them about healthier habits. Last month, we announced a foray into the fast growing health and well being category. This is squarely in line with the strategy to develop a portfolio in fast-growing demand spaces. One of the mega consumer trends that we are witnessing in the Indian consumer market is the increasing focus of consumers on the health in a very holistic way. From health as absence of disease, we are seeing a rapid shift towards health as a lifestyle pursuit with a strategic investment in Oziva and well-being nutrition. We welcome two young science-backed New Age brands into the HUL family. We have completed both the deals and are absolutely delighted to partner with the two businesses. The two companies will continue to be run by the respective teams led by their wonderful founders. HUL will provide them the necessary support needed to scale up their businesses, be it a strong understanding of consumers, our R&D capabilities, our regulatory expertise, our execution excellence, and the digital capability. We will also leverage Unilever's experience of running a billion euro health and well-being business. With this, let me now hand over to Ritesh to talk about a performance in this quarter and outlook in detail, and then <coughs> on the subject of royalty. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev, and good evening, everyone. My best wishes to you and your family for a great 2023. I will now walk you through our in-quarter performance and our outlook. Starting with overall results, this was yet another quarter of strong all-round performance. Our turnover for December quarter grew 16% with an underlying volume growth of 5%. Both value and volume growth were significantly ahead of the market. EBITDA margin was at a healthy 23.6%, sequentially up 30 BPS, led by gross margin improvement. On a year-on-year -year basis, EBITDA margin declined 180 BPS, impacted by 480 BPS increase in cost of goods sold, partly offset by savings and leverage across other lines of the PNL. Net profit, 
at Rs. 2,500 and 5 crores grew 12%. Profit after tax before exceptional items grew 13%. Let me click down further to elaborate how we are dynamically managing our business. We are seeing sequentially uh, inflation softening in few key commodities. As we had anticipated and called out earlier, our DQ22 net material inflation or NMI at 18% was sequentially lower than September quarter, albeit very high on a year-on-year -year basis. This helped partly bridge the price versus cost gap, leading to improvement in gross margin from 45% in September quarter to nearly 47% in December quarter. With softening in commodity, media intensity for categories in which we operate was higher in DQ22 versus SQ22. We continue to maintain our share of voice ahead of share of market and invest competitively behind our brands, leading to AT BPS quarter and quarter step up in ANP investments. Moving on to performance across our three segments. Home care delivered yet another stellar performance growing at 32% with double digit volume growth. Beauty and personal care grew 10% despite the impact of delayed winter on skincare portfolio. Foods and refreshment delivered 7% growth. Margins in all three segments remain healthy with home care at 19%, BPC at 25% and FNR at 18%. We will click down to talk about performance within each of the division in subsequent slides. Starting with some of our key innovations for this quarter, Tresemme launched a new salon-inspired keratin range of shampoo, conditioner, and it is enriched with Bondplex technology, our latest innovation that goes deep inside to repair broken hair bonds and make hair up to 20 times stronger. With Sentais, we launched our first ever scrub soap range. Sentai soaps are made with 100% natural ingredients like coconut water, aloe vera, walnut scrub that scrubs out dead skin cells and gives naturally glowing skin. LACME launched new range of serum spanning benefit spaces of brightening with niacinamide, hydration with hyaluronic acid and anti-aging with pro-retinol. Lifeboy launched a new superior soap with neem and aloe vera. Red Label launched a new premium tea especially designed for pregnant and lactating women. It has 80% less caffeine content and its Ayurvedic ingredients not only ensure a great taste but also known to nourish and energize the body. Brew's new decoction coffee is the perfect way to enjoy delicious and strong filter coffee. Taking inspiration from the latest cuisine trends and consumer insights, Nor has launched Korean meal pots and added new flavors with soup, a perfect solution for hopeless chefs like me. We have now quite a few interesting activations this quarter. I'm sure you heard the buzz around BIM's latest campaign. BIM is deeply committed to championing the cause of everyone taking ownership for their own home shores. It's BIM Black campaign, which as a satire launched BIM Black, specially designed for men, triggered a lot of social media conversation and got a very strong consumer response. Other key campaigns include Sunsix Pujo activation and new ad films by Horlicks and Surf Excel. Moving on to a performance in home care, this is another stellar quarter for home care with 32% growth led by solid performance across the portfolio. Despite high pricing, home care continues to grow volumes in double digit, reflecting the strength of our brands. Fabric Watch grew in high double digit with strong performance across brands and formats. Business continues to gain handsome market share, both value and volume. Household care accelerated further and grew in high double digits with strong performance in both dishwash and surface cleaners. Volumes grew in high teens. With significant input cost inflation, we have taken calibrated pricing actions in both fabric wash and household care. Talking about beauty and personal care, the business grew 10% led by skin cleansing, delivering broad-based double-digit growth. Volumes of skin cleansing grew mid-single digit. With softening in palm oil prices, price reduction were taken in soaps portfolio. Hair care delivered high single digit growth. Our innovations and future format such as masks and serums continue to gain consumer relevance. Delayed onset and lower intensity of winter impacted performance of winter portfolio in skin care. Non-winter portfolio performed well delivering double digit growth. We continue to expand our portfolio in emerging and on-trend demand spaces 
through focus innovations and market development actions. Oral care had a steady quarter led by close up. Let me now turn to foods and refreshment. FNR grew 7% led by strong performance in foods, coffee, and ice cream. Peak continued its value and volume market leadership and grew volumes in mid single digit. Overall value growth was soft, reflecting the impact of price cuts. Coffee sustained its strong growth momentum and grew in double digit. Health food drinks grew mid single digit with strong performance in boost and plus range. We continue to gain market share and penetration led by effective market development actions. HFD market remains subdued due to impact of inflation. Foods delivered volume led high teens growth with strong performance in ketchup, jams, and food solutions business. Our food solutions business that provides products for chefs and restaurants continues to scale up and is now almost twice the pre-COVID levels. Ice cream had another strong quarter with double digit growth led by festive activations and delicious innovations. Summarizing our performance for this quarter, we had a strong top line and bottom line delivery. I've already covered most of the lines, but let me pick up other income which saw an increase due to higher treasury yield and dividend from subsidiaries. Exceptional items were higher due to increase in supply chain restructuring cost. Effective tax rate for the quarter was 26%. Considering the impact of tax PPA that we received in the first half of this fiscal, we expect our full year ETR to be around 24%. Let me quickly take you through our year to date numbers for this fiscal. Our performance was strong both on top line and bottom line. We added 6,000 crores to our top line, growing at 17% and taking our nine month turnover to over rupees 43,500 crores. Despite unprecedented levels of inflation, we grew our EBITDA by 10% to more than rupees 10,000 crores. Net profit at 7,410 crore grew 14%. Now moving on to our outlook. We remain cautiously optimistic in near term. As we have seen earlier in the presentation, we have seen softening in a few key commodities, notably palm oil. If commodities were to remain where they are, and we believe that the worst of inflation is likely behind us. This augurs well for FMCG industry and should aid in gradual recovery in consumer demand. Having said that, we must be mindful that year-on-year -year inflation is still high and we expect growth to continue to be price-led. In this scenario, we will continue to manage our business dynamically with focus on ensuring right price value equation for a consumer and building back gross margin. We will continue investing competitively in our brands and market development actions leading to a further step up in our a &P investments. As Sanjeev mentioned, our strategies has unchanged and we remain focused on delivering 4G growth, growth that is consistent, competitive, profitable, and responsible. Now you have seen our announcement today about new royalty and central service arrangement with Unilever. In next few charts, I will cover the context and details of the new arrangement that has been approved by our board of directors today. Our current trademark and technology license and central service agreement with Unilever was signed in January 2013 for a period of 10 years. The effective payout for this arrangement was about 2.65% of turnover for the last fiscal. To put simply, this agreement grants us three key things. Number one, the right to use Unilever owned brands. Secondly, it gives us access to Unilever's technical know-how world-class R&D and innovation capabilities. Third, we leverage Unilever's expertise and services across various functions, including procurement, marketing, quality, manufacturing excellence, talent management, amongst others. I will give more color on each of these in subsequent charts, but important to call out that these capabilities have greatly equipped us to meet many emerging consumer needs and trends with agility and thus win in the marketplace. If you were to look back during the contract tenure, we almost doubled our turnover to more than 50,000 crore and improved our EBITDA margin by about 1,000 BPS. There is 100 BPS improvement on an average every year. Let me now kick down, as I mentioned earlier, on three elements I spoke about. Unilever, as you know, is one of the largest global consumer goods company with over 52 billion turnover spread across its five business unit, namely beauty and well-being, personal care, home care, nutrition, and ice cream. It's a truly global company with presence in over 190 countries 
and a strong understanding of emerging markets. About 60% of Unilever's turnover comes from emerging markets. Unilever is known for its great brands and purpose-driven business model. It has a wide portfolio of over 400 brands spread across several FMCG categories. Many of these are iconic world-renowned names. 12 Unilever brands feature in Kanta's top 50 global brand list. It also has a very strong portfolio of on-trend brands in new <coughs> and emerging demand spaces. Talking about Unilever's R&D progress, Unilever has deep science and technology expertise. It has a team of over 5,000 R&D professionals with many world-leading experts in the field from things like material chemistry, microbiome, alternative models to animal testing. Globally, Unilever has over 20,000 patents and patent applications. It has a very large network of innovation partners from big suppliers to innovative startups to some of the biggest technology companies in the world with eight global technology and innovation hubs that sit in key markets across US, Europe, India, and China. Unilever R&D has global scale and local knowledge. Annually, Unilever spends over 850 million in R&D doing cutting edge work, which will not only serve the consumer today, but also in future. Some of the examples include the work being done on renewable ingredients where Unilever is working on carbon rainbow, biofactorants for cleaning products, which are 100% renewable and biodegradable. Next generation biology is another key field where work is being done on microbiome and immunity, which is relevant for many of the categories, including hair, skin care, skin cleansing, and oral care. Unilever has a state-of-art food innovation center in the Netherlands, where they are doing a lot of work on sustainable food system, such as non-dairy plant-based protein. Many of these innovation technologies have already been deployed in India, and others will, we will keep bringing at appropriate time. It is important to note that R&D and technology not only helps us land faster, better innovation, but also in driving product cost optimizations. The third key arrangement uh, for us as part of this overall uh, scheme is a wide array of centralized services and functional expertise. This is really about leveraging Unilever's global scale and expertise across various functions, be it supply chain, procurement, marketing, or talent management. On the chart, you will see some of the examples of centralized services and support that we receive from Unilever. Access to this gives us significant competitive edge. Let me bring this alive with a couple of examples. If you look at our overhead cost, employee cost and other expenses put together, we are leading industry benchmark. And this is after having taken uh, in the expense line overall the royalty central services cost, which sits in this bucket in the last one decade. Our inventory levels are best in class. Access to Unilever's world-class manufacturing techniques, efficiency improvement programs, deeper planning and forecasting capabilities gives us the agility and ability to run our operations very efficiently. Another good example is Unilever's procurement capabilities. Unilever globally spends over Euro 20 billion in raw and packing material. Its huge scale and global presence gives us a significant competitive advantage in sourcing of input materials. Many of you would recollect from our Capital Markets Day about net revenue management and how it helped us navigating business during challenging environment. This entire science around NRM is something that we got from Unilever. Let me pick up an example on digital marketing. As you're aware, digital marketing has been gaining a lot of relevance in recent times. Unilever globally has developed centralized toolkits and digital assets which can be used by Unilever group companies, including HUL, to deploy its digital marketing, marketing strategy in their respective geographies. We have been able to leverage on the efforts of external agencies and knowledge database on marketing to deliver impactful digital marketing campaigns. So overall, we greatly benefit from Unilever's functional expertise and centralized services. The current contract, which was for a term of 10 years, will expire on 31st January 2023. On the imminent expiry of this contract, Unilever requested for a review of the same. We have been receiving a steady stream of benefits, as I mentioned, from Unilever in terms of faster innovation, superior products and technology, greater expertise and enhanced services. This helps us to continue to meet emerging consumer needs with agility and create value for all stakeholders. With India being one of its top three priority markets, Unilever remains committed to support HUL with dialed up access to faster innovation, 
investment technology and capabilities. The new contract comes to subject to a detailed evaluation and due diligence led by our senior management and guided by our audit committee and board. A reputed big four firm was engaged to conduct independent external benchmarking of comparable transactions. Taking the detailed due diligence and external benchmarking into consideration, HUL board has today approved the new royalty and central service arrangement effective 1st February 2023 for a tenure of five years. The new arrangement envisages a staggered increase of 80 BPS over a period of three years from circa 2.65% to circa 3.45% of turnover, which will result in an effective increase of cost 45 BPS from February to December 23, a further 25 BPS increase in effective cost from January to December 24, and a circa 10 BPS further increase in effective cost from January 25. So a total of 80 BPS over three years. New arrangement is subject to appropriate regulatory approvals. This new arrangement is one of the necessary investment that positions HUL well to continue delivering consistent, competitive, profitable, and responsible growth. Before we move to our Q&A session, let me summarize what we covered till now. We delivered yet another quarter of strong all-round performance with 16% top-line growth and 5% underlying volume growth. With price versus cost gap narrowing, we improved gross margin sequentially by 170 BPS and invested 160 crore more sequentially in ANP. Our EBITDA margin remains at a very healthy level and improved 30 BPS sequentially. Looking ahead, we remain cautiously optimistic in the near term. We believe peak inflation is behind us and this should aid in gradual improvement of consumer demand. Growth will continue to be price-led, albeit the level of price growth will be lower from here on. We will continue to manage our business dynamically with a focus on ensuring the right price value equation for our consumers, building back gross margins and stepping up A&P investments. Lastly, HUL board has approved the new royalty and central service arrangement with Unilever effective 1st February 2023. This envisages a 80 BPS increase staggered over the next three years. This is a necessary investment which positions as well to meet emerging consumer needs with agility and continue delivering 4G growth. With this, we complete our prepared remarks and let me now hand over to Ravi to begin Q&A session. Thanks, Ratesh. With this, we'll now move on to the Q&A session. Um, so that we are able to take questions from all participants, I request you to kindly restrict the number of questions to a maximum of two at a time. In case you have further questions, you are free to join the queue again. Uh, in addition to the audio, as always, our participants have an option to post the questions through the web. We'll take those questions just before we end. With that, I'd like to hand the call back to Aman to manage the Q&A session for us. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on the touchdown telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Abnish Roy from Novama Institutional Equities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, congratulations, uh, Sanjeev, on the result. Uh, my first question is on the royalty uh, aspect. So three bits to that. Uh, one is uh, earlier contract was for 10 years. Uh, this is for five years uh, because uh, then uh, the risk for uh, increase, say, five years down the line clearly seems to be there. So what's the thought process behind five years and not 10 years? Second is, uh, why is the increase front-ended? So 45 bips in first year and then 25 and then 10. So what's the thought process? And third is, uh, what are the approvals needed here? Uh, Avish, uh, thanks for your question. Uh, so let me just pick up all three uh, elements that you mentioned. So first of all, the contract duration. Uh, you write the earlier contract was for a period of 10 years. And we know the world is very, very volatile. And we are living in times which are very different. In these times, uh, it's a good corporate governance to lock in a contract for five years and as situations will change, will improve uh, in different directions and the context will change, uh, we will then have a chance to revisit the terms that we are agreeing to. And which is why uh, this time the agreement has been for a period of five years. Uh, and then your, your point on overall increase, let me just spend a few minutes in talking about it. First of all, there are two components out here. 
there is a royalty, and royalty has two sub-components. There is a royalty for trademark, for usage of brands of Unilever, and second for usage of technology that we get from Unilever. That's one component of the arrangement. The second large component of the arrangement is central services. So we get many services from Unilever, and I give multiple examples as part of my presentation, be it procurement, be it digital marketing, be it learning, uh, and be it other capabilities that we get from Unilever. And that's the second large component of the arrangement. The 3.45% destination as part of the five-year term arrangement that we spoke about is basically 1.95% for the bucket of the two royalty put together and 1.5% for central services. Now, this total rate of 3.45%, as we called out, will increase by 80 BPS. And uh, while approving this 80 BPS and considering the proposal, board conducted a very detailed due diligence process. Board appointed, as I mentioned, a big four firm to also do an independent assessment of the rate of increase, which was getting considered as part of the proposal. And uh, we received those uh, independent benchmarks, and the new rates that we have are very competitive. Uh, that was one assurance the board took as part of the process. Uh, second, of course, is the amount of benefits that we get from Unilever. Because behind this contract also is stream of benefits, be it brands that we get from Unilever, or be it technology uh, for driving across our portfolio that we get from Unilever, or for that matter, multiple services that we get from Unilever. SUL remains a top three priority market for Unilever, so these benefits will continue to come to our business for times to come as part of the contract. Look at the last decade. In the last decade, as part of the contract, with all the benefits that we have received, we run a very successful business. The business has doubled in terms of turnover and has also improved healthy margins as well by 1,000 BPS. That's one element. Now, the second element of the whole conversation out here is the context in which we are agreeing and, and which is why there's a very uh, thoughtful job of ensuring that the increase is spread out over a period of three years. And that's where the judgment of board has come in terms of making the contract over three years. And you heard the three numbers that we spoke about. So this is in terms of the overall context in which we have done the arrangement. And what we have now is approval from the board of directors. Uh, going forward, uh, we know the requirement under SEBI's LODR, or for that matter, Companies Act, that any material transaction will require appropriate amount of approvals, regulatory approvals. Uh, it could be the case in this uh, case as well. And we will take those approvals as required. We remain confident. At the end of the day, uh, we know that this arrangement will bring superior value to all our shareholders. And hence, we should be able to create a very clear business case that how this arrangement will continue to benefit our business going forward. And that, in my mind, will be the foundation basis which we will then conduct the balance approvals going ahead. So thanks. Uh, my last question is uh, on two of your categories. So when I see your HFT, the commentary seems to be improving. And you have said that uh, strong performance in boost. So I wanted to understand you have taken so much of marketing initiative and uh, uh, the two rupee sachet, et cetera, in Horlicks also. But you're pointing towards boost. So wanted to understand why boost is going faster. Uh, so is it linked to the overall uh, rural slowdown? So the lower end, smaller packs in Horlicks is linked to the rural uh, slowdown. So it will recover when the rural recovery happens. Is that the reason? And second category I want to ask is, in fabric wash kind of highly penetrated, the double digit volume growth, uh, the market share gains are com coming from the number two player or essentially from the regional? Because it's not a high growth category to start with, but double digit growth uh, is, a, is a good achievement. Yeah. No, thanks, Amish. Uh, so let me just pick up uh, both of your questions. Uh, and let me start with HFD. Um, HFD, we have called out very clearly uh, the jobs that we have to do in this space. Uh, first, our job was to drive cost synergies, and we have mentioned in last few quarters consistently how we are running ahead of the business case in terms of driving cost synergy. And the second big job for us is to drive revenue synergy. And this is where we had articulated that to drive revenue synergy, uh, the big job to be done is to drive market development, because we have to increase the relevance of this category and drive penetration. Our commentary has been consistent and strong that for last quarters, as we spoken about, that this market development efforts have started to yield re e results. And you've seen that last few quarter commentary we spoke about how we are improving market share, how we are able to improve penetration of the category. And ultimately, that's the objective when you spend resources behind driving market development. And of course, we have a portfolio out here 
uh, be it the plus range, and which is what you mentioned, that we do want to dial up the plus range, which gives higher order benefits and science-based based benefits to a consumer. Equally boost, we took boost uh, from a sub certain set of geographies and we took boost nat uh, nationally and activated the brand. And it's a very different consumer profile that uses boost, or for that matter, that consumes Horlicks. And you're right, Horlicks has different price points and different pack sizes which are sold and experimented by different consumers. So if I look at overall business performance for Horlicks, the objective of achieving penetration growth, the objective of achieving market share gain, we have delivered on that as well. Overall, the inflation impact, as we have called out on HFD, has been meaningful. And it is not the case only with Horlicks as a product. To make a cup of Horlicks, we require Horlicks and a cup of milk. And milk prices, as we uh, called out and Sanjeev covered as well, the kind of inflation that you've seen in milk price and hence the overall cup of Horlicks, that inflation impact has impacted discretionary consumption. But at the end of the day, the job is very clearly cut out for us, which is to keep driving category relevance, and we are seeing better results coming from that. Now, coming to your question on fabric wash. Uh, fabric wash is a category we called out that over the last one decade, the kind of work we have done to change the way we sell the fabric wash portfolio. Our premium products, be it liquids, be it premium powders, have grown pretty well. And the total portion of our business in a portfolio now is over-indexed to liquids and premium, uh, premium part of the portfolio compared to mass part of the portfolio. That shift over a period of time has given us a benefit. I mean, when you talked about the growth price and UVG, remember, uh, Amish, in our case, UVG growth has two components. It has a component of volume, tonnage growth. It also has a component of mix. So when you sell higher products which are premium, the benefit of that overall comes in the bucket of UVG. And you, you heard us talking about strong UVG growth also in the case of uh, laundry. And that's the business model that we have at play out here. I'll just amplify, Abneesh, uh, on the HFD and the laundry story. You know, in many ways, the work that we are doing on HFD is the work that we did in laundry seven, ten years back. And that is the benefit that we are uh, now reaping. We invested in very clear strategy first. Second is uh, we had multiple formats and brands and sub-brands to play with. And then we invested significantly in market development to help us get into uh, higher order benefit space uh, as well as premiumize the portfolio. Now, in laundry, you had a question, whom are we gaining with? Let me tell you the kind of growth we have got is nearly in the vicinity of 30%. Surf, Excel, Wheel, and Ren all are growing in that vicinity. And uh, same goes with uh, uh, Comfort, which is also in the 20s growth. So, when you play it well, and this is a similar thing we are trying to imitate, but in a different manner with HFT as well, so that you start getting the benefit of this. And the early signs are that our penetration and our shares have started moving majestically over the last one year in HFT. Sure, uh, Sanjeev, thanks. That's useful. Just one last follow-up on the health food. So you now have two brands here. Uh, so Oziva also has uh, obviously great uh, products, uh, decent brand. Some products, there is there can be an overlap now or later also. So if you could tell us in terms of brand architecture and focus, how do these two brands play in the slightly more premium health category? I'm not talking about the HFD. I'm talking about uh, some of the other uh, premium products where both can play. How the differentiation would be? Now, health and wellness, uh, is relatively a nascent category in India. Now, here we are getting into demand spaces such as sleep, beauty from within, gut health, and these are where uh, the acquisitions that we have done and health and wellness is going to focus on. Now, in many ways, this will be complementary to the work that is happening on the HFT business because that is also working on nourishing a billion lives. Now that is looking at uh, helping people who are undernourished or malnourished or people who suffer from vitamins, mineral deficiency and all to plug that gap. Whereas here, 
it will be very specific in areas that I talked about, like gut health, sleep, and beauty from within. Now, it, both these brands are still at a very nascent stage. And at the end of the day, the way we play the portfolio, that uh, it may be in a similar demand space, but it could be a different proposition and different pricing point. That's how we will try to differentiate the brands as we start growing them. Sure, thanks. Uh, that's very useful. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thanks, Anish. Thank you. Next question is on the line of Vivek M. from Jeffries. Please go ahead. Hi, Sanjeev. Hi, Ritesh. Hi, Vivek. Uh, uh, you know, uh, two or three points on royalty bit again. Uh, and actually, these are essentially, you know, the investor feedback that I have received. So, you know, one view is this 10 percentage point margin increase or uh, uh, the doubling of revenues or, let's say, negative working capital. Wouldn't a lot of that would be, you know, more of an India factor, more of, you know, what you have achieved as Hindustan Unilever, even from a talent standpoint, while I hear you about, you know, the talent management part that you mentioned, but India still has been, you know, or Hindustan Unilever has still been, you know, uh, an important contributor to the talent pool. So how do you think about, you know, how do you balance this equation between Unilever versus Hindustan Unilever in several ways? You know, uh, uh, we have a very symbiotic relationship with Unilever. There are areas uh, where, you know, our pool of talent, we send them outside to Unilever group companies. We train them in the bigger part of Unilever in different geographies, and then we get them back. You know, there are people sitting on this table right now. Yeah, whether it is my investor relation head or whether it is my learned CFO, they have gone through the same drill. Yeah, so that is something which will continue. But where uh, Vivek Unilever comes and helps us, you know, what the chart that, uh, 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 you know, we were portraying earlier on, say, R&D. Yeah, if you look at R&D, we are today trying to operate on three axes, where we meet the consumer needs, where we have... Uh, products which are superior and uh, they are uh, sustainable. Now, whether it is replacing fossil fuel-based derivatives in laundry through carbon rainbow or getting into biosurfactants or uh, in, uh, say, skin care, getting into microbiome or getting into skinification or getting into neurosignaling. Now, these are things where we have big global labs, where they have access to the whole ecosystem, and that we, you know, HUL can access thanks to the relationship we, which we have with Unitiva. The other bit is, you know, Ritesh talked about procurement, for instance. Now, when you procure 20 billion worth of, 20 billion euro worth of raw materials and packaging materials, you get certain big benefit of scale. You get benefit of relationships that have been built over the years across the world, and we get access to that. So there are very clear benefits which HUL gets out of Unilever, and the way I would urge all of you to look at it, it is like any other expense. Say tomorrow, if I were to increase the salaries of my people, then obviously the question will be, is the benefits that we get out of the talents that we deploy? Yeah. Similarly, when we spend money on BMI or on royalty, is are we getting the value for the spin? And I can confidently tell you that yes, it may not be apparent to naked eyes, but there are very clear benefits to HUL and the value that we get out of payment of this thing. Got it, Sanjeev. Uh, Sanjeev, I'll tell you the, the worry that a lot of, uh, and in fact, yeah. I have spoken to your holders uh, as well on this issue. The worry yeah. is that can it go the Indonesia way? Because as margins are moving up, there, are, there is a five-year visibility. And uh, I mean, I think India still is half of where, or less than half of where Indonesian margins are. So the, the feeling is, uh, you know, a bit that, you know, because you are now earning more, 
so the propensity to pay for that is that should go up surely because you are earning more and uh, otherwise you know this this higher royalty number could have been there from 2013 But uh, but you know that's the view, Sanjeev, and that's where no, the concern is. No, let me. Nijan, I am I am glad we make you raise this issue. Now let me try to dispel it. You, you know, first is if you were to do a comparative benchmarking, and this is something which Ritesh alluded to, we are better off than most of our peer group. Yeah. So it is not that just because there are benchmarks, we have tried to pay that kind of royalty. No. we have gone through a very detailed process we have looked at it from a lens that are we getting value or not and we have a fabulous people on uh, on a board as independent directors and who go through that rigor to ensure that we are getting as a company the value for what we have contracted for yeah and only after that process do we agree to it now i would urge you to please tell your investors that not to worry about it i don't want to talk about indonesia yeah indonesia is still a great company but we have to look at it from our context in india is uh, we have had a very successful track record and we are clearly the uh, among the top 3 priority ca- ca- countries uh, for unilever and if you look at any of the strategies of unilever for any of the business group india would be right on top when it comes to priority that means we get access to the best technology we get access to the best of innovations we get huge talent and resources deployed to meet the needs of the indian business so i would say that guys don't worry about it yeah this is a business which is uh, on absolutely sound footing and uh, a long term strategy is very clear that we will have double digit eps and just like the other expenses we take it in our stride similarly we will take this in our stride because it gives us value and we will ensure that we keep delivering on a strategy thanks sanjeev for taking pains to explain this part one more bit you know uh, if you can just clarify because that's again come from two shareholder two holders uh, shareholders in hindustan unilever which is you know when you have had considered this proposal the independent directors and governance side uh, nobody has any uh, you know any concern but the view also is that should you not have gone to minority shareholder taken a majority of minority approval as purely as a good practice as a good governance you, you know right now we have taken just the board approval and whatever is required as per law we will go through that process you know we always maintain the highest standards of governance we comply with the law of the land whatever is required we will do that and we have to mention this is subject to necessary approvals that we require to complete a transaction the first process of any such transaction always is board approval you can't get into any further regulatory approvals unless the board has approved and which is why that's always the first step and of course we'll end up doing as sanjeev mentioned whatever other approvals we need require under sebi lodr or for the or for the matter companies act we will get those approvals as well and given the value that is there to sanjeev's point in this for all shareholders we are even confident that we should be able to secure those approvals as well yeah the what we are yes. alluding to vivek that forget the minority and majority first i think the most important way and even we as management do we first look at the interest of the company and all the shareholders that's what we are being paid to do and that's what we will keep doing it i think that will be uh, reassuring just uh, Uh, just on this bit ritesh are you suggesting majority of minority approval will be needed in this case see uh, if you look at uh, with the sebi uh, lodr and the requirement you no know, there are two different requirements uh, there is a requirement for royalty and there is a requirement for all other transactions and as appropriately a related party approval whenever you do uh, you will always end up having the related party not part of the conversation so as i mentioned whatever we need to do as a next step the first step was board approval and which is what we have taken today and we will do appropriately what was required in the sebi lodr and for it matter companies act and that's that's the next logical step for us
Yeah. Got it. And last question for you, if I may, Ritesh, which is basically, let's say, until until whenever this proposal was put up, uh, you know, to the board, uh, until then you were running with uh, some assumptions from a you know from a few years standpoint. How does this incremental, let's say, eighty basis point change those? Will they, like Sanjeev mentioned briefly, do you envisage you know offsetting it and therefore still you know uh, reaching the goal? How will this play out from a purely from a P and L standpoint? The overall uh, Vivek, uh, as you remember, when in the capital markets day we spoke about our long-term financial growth model, and we had articulated uh, our long-term financial growth model. We are aiming to deliver double-digit EPS growth for medium and long term. And at the end of the day, uh, there are various costs. Costs like this are always part of the assumptions before you make a long-term plan. And uh, so in spite of this cost of attendance, matter any other cost, we are committed to deliver double-digit EPS growth. And as we called out as part of that financial growth model, unlike the past decade, where our strong EPS growth has been driven by top line and substantial margin improvement, the next decade EPS growth will be driven more from top line growth and with a modest margin improvement. And that modest margin improvement will come because of two reasons as, as I called out. A, because the mix of the portfolios keeps improving, the way we drive market development for driving premiumization, and second, the leverage that the PNL gets because of the scale of growth that we have in the business. So that objective of driving double digit EPS growth does not change. Got it, Ritesh. Got it, Sanjeev. Thank you. Wish you all the best, and uh, yeah, look forward to you know double-digit growth uh, numbers from you year after year. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is in the line of Arnab Mitra from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Sanjeev and Ritesh. Uh, thanks for taking the question. I just wanted to understand your commentary on rural a little better. Uh, clearly, you are sounding more optimistic now than let's say three, four months back. Uh, other than the Nielsen data, which is showing some improvement, uh, are there other data points or your own sales uh, uh, you know, analysis that makes you a little more confident that we possibly are going to see a modest improvement from here on? You know, uh, when times are tough, you look at green shoots, right? And there was a period of time when we used to look at Nielsen data, we used to very clearly see that uh, even the value growth in rural has turned negative. That was in the mid-year. And uh, a big company like ours, growing headline growth in uh, mid-teens, you know, would not have happened if you were not growing value in rural. So the good bit is that despite this high inflation, People in rural area, when it comes to real rupee paisa spending, they have been spending more than last year. Yeah, and uh, certainly on our brands. And even when I look at it today in our rural, in the last five months, we have seen value growth. And this value growth in the December quarter has been higher than the September quarter and the mat number. So these are the green shoots, yeah? But like last time, if you remember, I had alluded to that there are a couple of things we will have to observe very closely. One is that when the government uh, stops the money on the free food grains, and uh, what then happens to Manrega budget? Yeah, whether the government keeps a leash on Manrega or do they spend more on Manrega or there is a more demand on Manrega? That would be one indicator. And the other indicator would be, of course, how the market shapes us in our category, which would then be linked to what happens to harvest, what happens to the ingredients which go into, what happens to the net realization of farmers, and what happens to the rural wage growth. All those factors will come in. So we are not jumping to conclusion that uh, everything is hunky-dory. What we are just alluding to from a real back period in June, July, we have definitely seen improvement. Uh, thanks, and just one follow-up on that. One change I noticed was that till last quarter you were highlighting low end of beauty, essentially brands like Glow and Lovely uh, facing a challenge. Uh, this quarter, your non-bitter skincare seems to have grown much better. 
are you seeing some that pressure now behind in terms of the marks uh, personal care kind of category you know our total beauty and personal care as you would have seen has grown in double digits and even when i look at uh, this quarter our gal growth has been reasonably decent in fact it has been in double digit yeah and uh, but yes the winter was for uh, instance our vaseline is a big brand which sells in winter where the sales definitely shoots up that was impacted because the winter was very slow in coming in december understood and my last question was on gross margins uh, so so your gross margins are now 47 uh, and if i look at the pre period of this very high inflation it was 52 to 54 you're still very behind that number so from here on you know assuming that crude and other commodities don't go down further uh, do you uh, take an approach of continuously passing pricing over a longer period of time to get back that margin or is margin improvement from here on contingent on Uh, commodity costs actually falling more from where it is yeah. currently see see margin improvement assume for the time being that the price is stabilized at this level right then the margin improvement will come through premiumization of portfolio the mix change and the margin improvement will come out of leveraging the scale when it comes to pricing we will always be conscious about the price value equation and competitive pricing we will never outprice ourselves sure and uh, just the one add on to that there was this news that you had further taken price increases in the month of january is, is that accurate and uh, have you taken further price increases in this quarter as we speak yeah so uh, uh, another one pricing uh, in the in, in december quarter uh, let me call out two categories which is uh, first is fabric wash for home care and uh, second is hfd these are the categories where we have seen sequential increase in commodity cost uh, and we called out some of these commodities uh, be it milk be it barley uh, be it soda ash and of course the impact of uh, rupee depreciation uh, as the dollar keeps strengthening and because of that in those categories uh, we have taken sequential price increase on the other way around we we called out two categories be it tea or soap those are the places where we also then uh, reduced uh, our prices uh, passing on the benefit to some extent on uh, commodity coming down but if i just go back to the question that uh, conversation that uh, sanjeev mentioned earlier the price versus cost uh, if i look at last quarter uh, we had a 22% net material inflation and we had 12% pricing so net 10% price versus cost gap that in december quarter has come down where the headline inflation net material inflation is 18% and our pricing has been 11 and hence a net price versus cost deficit of 7 so the job that we will have to do as sanjeev articulated earlier is to keep working through this price versus cost gap through uh, innovation through mix uh, through scale leverage uh, and then work through gross margin improvement in in quarter ahead and we must understand that when you look at the total company results they are the weighted average results of the company now within that there could be categories where the commodities could have gone up where we may may where we might have taken price increase and there could be commodities where the commodity price has gone down where we would have taken the price down yeah but what you reflect on total company of course is the weighted average and in to your specific uh, question on the january newspaper article i'm assuming you're referring that uh, we had clarified uh, uh, it was factually incorrect okay thanks so much uh, sanjeev and take care on the test thank you thank you The next question is on the line of Kunal Bora from BNP Pharma. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, question again on pricing. You mentioned that sales will be price led. Uh, is this only in the near term, or would you say that this could apply to FY24 as well? How should we look at uh, the equation in FY24, assuming raw material price stabilizes as price hike becomes a part of the base and some price cut or grammage uh, which you are taking in categories like soap start kicking in? Now, first, let me explain that ideally. we would want volume led profitable growth that's what we would want to deliver yeah but when you have this kind of inflation then obviously we will have to pass on the cost to the consumers to protect the business model but we do it in a manner that a consumer franchise remains protected now look at it kunal that even during this december quarter 
when the total volume as per nielsen has shrunk for the market by 4% we have grown our volumes by 5% so that is significantly outpacing the market so we never take our eyes off volumes yeah for us the underlying volume growth will always remain a key performance indicator but we have to live in a world which uh, we have to uh, confront the reality and the reality is that if the prices go up such extent the consumers thankfully are still spending more money but they would titrate the volume which is completely understandable and we are gaining both volume and value shares so look at it from that lens that we have significantly strengthened our business in the last 2 years gaining volume shares gaining value shares and protecting our margin to the extent possible just to get this right so as the pricing contribution uh, moderates from here do you see volumes offsetting that uh, how do we see the sales uh, growth from here see the volume will of course be driven by i believe that if one is moderation of inflation the other is the inflation which had come in recedes leaving aside palm oil we have not seen the 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 receding of inflation yeah just to give you a very simple example if we look at crude oil versus same quarter 21 the price growth has been 10% so it would look very nice yeah it's a moderate price increase but when you look at versus 2020 it's a 100% increase so in simple average it's 90 and 10 yeah so it is not that like palm oil where versus december quarter 20 the price increase is just 5% that means the prices which had gone up it's not that they are now growing at a lower rate they have come back and that's when we pass back to the consumers and that is when we will start seeing the volume growth come back that has still not happened leaving aside a few commodities sure sure that's clear second and last question uh, what are your, what are the trends which you are seeing in the d2c space uh, have you seen acquisitions by fmcg companies of these companies are you seeing reduced aggression from these new players and as uh, their funding is drying up and also if you can talk about uh, any trends which you are seeing in b2b e-commerce any the reduction in contribution from these days see it is, see it is very apparent that when the modern trade say modern trade stores were closed during covid or they were uh, not operational uh, in the full capacity that was a time when a lot of consumers had shifted to e-commerce and of course uh, in a country like india is uh, shopping in modern trade goes beyond shopping right it's an outing for the family people still love and do should love to go and do shopping it is touch and feel so as modern trade has opened up and the the growth rates in modern trade have picked up it has impacted uh, the d2c space certainly but d2c for the sheer benefit and convenience that it offers it is going to be a secular growth story albeit it's still a small channel relative to say the general trade yeah but the growth rates will remain faster and it's also a reality that the time of easy money has gone away and investors i would believe would start now focusing not just on the headline growth but also on the business fundamentals and in the long term there is no substitute for business fundamentals understood uh, that's it from my side thank you very much sir thank you the next question is from the line of shirish pardeshi from centrum broking please go ahead hi good evening uh, uh, ritesh and uh, sanjeev thanks for the opportunity and my hearty congratulations for the stupendous growth in the quarter just a uh, one read through uh, while in my field trips uh, what i found that there is a incremental consumer shifting from detergent bars to powder now to what extent this uh, phenomena is there because uh, to my understanding central india and the northern india was behind uh, the growth in the powders so is that growth is now 
primarily driven the upper half of the india and uh, there is some more growth is latent which is also going to come in the subsequent quarter you know if we look at uh, uh, it's not that the bars have disappeared yeah bars is still a pretty significant part of the market and the other bit is mass markets in the mass market segment is still a very large component so our strategy has been to move the bars to solution wash our strategy has been to upgrade consumers from mass powders to higher order benefits and from powders to specialists yeah is like liquids like matrix and that is the strategy that will continue to into the future and uh, i can assure you that uh, despite uh, uh, fabric cleaning being a universally penetrated category the headroom to grow is massive and we are over indexed as you go up the pyramid in terms of market shares understood very good uh, uh the the other question you, you is, know this uh, is a this is a good question and uh, for all my friends on the call i would just let you all reflect on that the work that we did on laundry which i was i think explaining to vivek or abnish or what we did on tea you know we have to do the work consistently for a few years before you start seeing the benefit in the results and uh, this consistent strategy executed with precision and having knowing both the science and art of market development that's what gives you joy and the similar thing we have done in hair for instance i got that uh, sanjeev i completely echo that having spent time on the field uh the the second related question on this uh, is that the the 32% growth what we have gathered uh in this quarter is it suffice to say that <clears throat> 50% is coming from the price and 50% is volume or 2/3 is price and 1/3 is volume no, about 40% say volume okay thank you and my last question uh, if i draw the parallel uh, you you did uh, mention in between that uh, or ritesh did mention that we are doing a lot of work around the hfd on the activation and we have taken almost 5 7 years uh, to get the benefits in the uh, detergent and home care business does that mean that uh, uh, the similar time it will take in hfd beginning no 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 what i you, you know it is not that our laundry results have been giving us results for the last 5 6 years it is not that we are now we have reached that point where we are outpacing the competitors by a mile that's where we have reached so i am not saying that hfc we are going to wait for 7 8 years to see the results is i believe the results will come in much earlier so actually i am looking for a qualitative comment of when actually we see growth uh, which is higher than yeah, 10% l- l- let me give you like this that had the inflation not been there we would have got the results by now yeah but with the increase in prices of barley by 120% skim milk powder by 50% over the last two years that's made a significant impact otherwise we would have got it much earlier so if say if say the commodity prices if there is a certain stimulus which leads to uh, commodity prices deflating then we'll start seeing a much higher growth in hft come in much earlier i i agree sanjeev your point but just to dwell on uh, the amount of sampling we have done 1 million plus sampling and the penetration and distribution what we have done i mean yeah, somewhere yeah, 1 million se zyada ki hai humne 1 million to bahut kam hai sir that's what i'm saying that ki where is the conversion is still uh... you, you, you know the today the conversion is happening in terms of shares etc the conversion is happening when we are getting increase in the penetration where we are bringing more consumers into the fold yeah but then what happens at a middle class level people who are using the bigger pack cars they start to reducing the consumption to manage the budget yeah as that eases this will go back and our job also is to build much increased relevance for the category and our plus range is doing exceedingly well 
Wonderful. Thank you, and uh, all the best to you and the team. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Parsi Pantaki from IIFL. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, in one of the earlier questions, you mentioned that uh, basically apart from uh, palm oil, you have not seen uh, uh, commodity costs uh, correct meaningfully. Now, my question is, supposing if they don't, if they just stabilize at where they are rather than correcting, uh, in that scenario, uh, how do you see the uh, volume growth and the overall top line growth and margins uh, panning out? Because uh, also in addition to uh, this, there was one more question uh, on the margins, uh, where you mentioned that from now on, the margin expansion will come uh, 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 only if the input cost goes down or due to normal premiumization, cost efficiencies, etc. But I think one or two quarters earlier, you had mentioned that we would reach 25%, 25.2, which was there uh, before the inflationary cycle started, we would reach there pretty soon. And after that, we would have uh, a modest margin expansion on back of premiumization, etc. So just to summarize my question, if the input costs remains I, where I, they are, how do you I see the effect on volume, top line and margin? I get you, Percy. Percy, you know, if you look at the story of the last nine, ten years, when we have improved the margin by 1,000 pips, it is not by moving away from the strategic price points. Yeah, We improve the margins is one by getting the benefit of scale. Second, importantly, is premiumization. We are not significantly over-indexed to the market in terms of premiumization. The third is market development, getting into new segments, which are inherently having a higher margin. Yeah. And uh, wherever we, there was an opportunity where we took modest price increases, we kept doing that. So that was the rhythm. Now, your question is that the commodity price, this becomes a new normal, for instance. Yeah, so this becomes a zero base from here yeah. onwards. Then we will have to play a similar game, drive our saving agenda harder, yeah, is uh, which we have been doing, and keep doing that. And if more cost increase doesn't come in, then the saving agenda will translate into margin improvement. Similarly, if more inflation doesn't come in, a mixed change will translate into margin improvement. And that's how the way we played the game in the last few years, similarly we'll play going into the future. And if we are at 23.6, also Percy, we will not shy away from investing yeah. behind a brands. You know, we invest yeah. A share of voice to share of market is anywhere in the vicinity of 120 to 130. We're not going to shy away from that, and that's what we will maintain because we always play the game for the long term. And uh, getting it from 23.26, if we can come from 14.15 to 23.6 or 25, 23.6 to 25 is not a long journey, I can assure you. Understood, sir. And also on volumes, you are currently clocking around 5%. Yeah. So any acceleration from here, is it contingent on commodity costs actually going down from here or they can accelerate in uh, a scenario where commodity costs are stable at this level as well? They lift because this has also got to do with macroeconomics, right? If, for instance, India has another year of 6-7% growth, yeah, and even if the inflation is at uh, a modest 4-5%, you would be talking about a nominal growth which would be in the vicinity of 11-12%. And if that happens and it is dispersed in a sensible manner across the population strata, then I see no reason why they will not start consuming more. Understood. But I would be right in assuming that uh, in FI24, if we are to target close to a double-digit top-line growth, then we would have to do at least a high single-digit volume growth to reach there. Would that sort of yeah, construct you know, in my mind be but, reasonable? But see, you're not wrong because historically we have delivered anywhere between 65 to 70% of our growth through volume growth. Understood. Understood. Uh, so my second question is, sorry, couldn't hear that. 
I said that's under a normative environment. Understood. My my second question is on skin care, which was a category which was affected by the COVID related disruption as well as the uh, pressure on incomes, inflation, etc. Now in skin care, apart from the uh, adverse seasonality, your uh, portfolio has grown in double digits. So would you say that uh, basically whatever issues were there from a macroeconomic standpoint uh, in this category? uh they are resolved and uh, the recovery is uh, sort of uh, done and dusted or do you see uh, some uh, i mean we are only partially uh, through the recovery uh, uh, in your view you know because uh, perthi there has been price increase also in skin care maybe not to the same extent as skin cleansing or personal wash and laundry but still there has been mm. a good price growth in skin care yeah is uh, so the real test will be because it is relatively discretionary when the consumers have more disposable income i would believe that is when we will feel far more confident about skin care either the inflation remains where it is doesn't go up the commodity prices don't go up or they start deflating while the gdp keeps growing that would be then we'll certainly see discretionary items like skin care getting a much bigger fillet right and my last question is on this free food scheme which the government has uh, recently sort of rejigged they have discontinued some part and they have sort of made the other part free etc but there is still a net uh, sort of hit uh, to the inflows into the hands of the poor people on account of this scheme what is your view is is this like a a a material macroeconomic uh, event uh, for fmcg or it's uh, something which is which we should not dwell on too closely or we should not uh, sort of focus too much energies on no, no. the way i would look at it is that government has put in big budget under two schemes one was when they were giving certain 5 kg or something free ration the other was subsidized ration at 2 rupees a kg and all yeah so what they are doing is they are pulling they have pulled out the free that they were giving but the subsidized one they will now give it free yeah so earlier there were two benefits coming in but the there would be i think you know as uh, first looking at it from a national perspective relief of the stressed is one of the big core jobs of the government and uh, one of the reasons why the headline growth in rural has remained during these tough times during the covid period and during the post covid high inflation period has been the support that the government provided to the rural poor yeah and uh, getting into the election year i think every government will be cognizant that you need to look after your poor who are stressed right that's that's all from me sanjeev thanks and all the best thank you thank you i now hand the conference back to mr a ravi shankar to proceed with the text questions received by the webcast participants over to you sir thank you um we'll start with questions from richard uh, two questions the first is on rural uh, his question reads from what we hear from most companies this whole narrative of rural recovery seems to be premised on government doing a lot more for the rural folks base effect apart in the event the government chooses not to be populist in the run up to the next election what actions can companies take to drive a recovery example what levers are available at hcl disposable to drive the recovery assuming no help from government um uh, <clears throat> thanks sir um Sure. On rural, as we called out, there are of course more than one variable. Uh, there will be of course variables that uh, government will lean in, in terms of support to rural economy. And uh, for a minute, if I just keep that aside, since already a lot of work has happened in terms of support, uh, if I just look at our own internal variables within FMCG, the point that you mentioned that the biggest hurt that rural has got uh, is on inflation. And uh, with inflation, uh, as we spoke, uh, a peaking out in September quarter. and we have seen moderation in december quarter and if that trend continues 
that will surely augur well in terms of the bite the inflation has on overall dispersal income and the spend capacity that consumers have in rural area. We also seen uh, pretty good encouraging data on farm income. Uh, that also augurs well. We've seen farm inflation and hence farm margin that also augurs well. Uh, we've seen the, uh, the sowing which has happened for winter crop. Uh, hopefully that will also give good amount of boost. So there are more than one factor which is also uh, uh, in this point in time is favoring uh, the amount of work which is happening in the rural area. Uh, at this stage, uh, you saw our commentary. We do see the rural slowdown is bottoming out. And uh, in our mind over the next uh, few months, three, four months, we'll have to see as to from once it has bottomed out, uh, where the trajectory goes from here, as each of these variables that I mentioned about, they, they start to pan out. Uh, in the meantime, the job that we have to do on market development, uh, we, we continue to do that job. And, uh, and that uh, is a longer term story, uh, as we mentioned about uh, value creation for FMCG overall. With India having spent $46 per capita consumption, rural within that, as we had spoken about, is, is more like $25, $30. So there's a massive amount of job to be done in terms of developing market in rural area. So the long term trend of value creation in rural area by driving consumption penetration, that will continue. So those levers, apart from what I mentioned about uh, the macro context lever which are changing now, should help us to keep driving sales. But this is something in the next few months time, you'll see how it pans out. All right. Uh, the second question uh, is on the royalty arrangement. Uh, in the last announcement on royalty change in 2013, the terminal rate was to have gone up to 3.15, but the rate is still 2.65. What were the reasons that the rate didn't go all the way up to 3.15 as agreed last time? Yeah. So what has happened also uh, along the way in last one decade, uh, when we had uh, put up the royalty contract a decade ago, and we had seen the destination to reach to 3.15. And uh, but the portfolio has evolved over last uh, one decade, and the substantial impact, uh, Richard, which has come is uh, through acquisition of Horlicks, uh, which uh, which we bought the business from GSK Horlicks and Boost. And uh, these brands have been acquired by Hindustan Unilever, and uh, the trademark is owned by Hindustan Unilever, so they don't attract uh, the, the charge of uh, royalty and trademark and, uh, and for that matter, technology. Uh, similar is the case with Indulekha, similar is the case with uh, Vwash. So there are this portfolio that we acquired and we have grown, and this portfolio does not attract those costs. And hence, the weighted average cost as it has panned out is lower compared to what was envisioned uh, when we done the contract a decade ago. Um, one other question on royalty, and uh, I think we can then call it today. Uh, what has changed for higher royalty? There's a question from Manoj. Uh, Manoj, we spoke uh, a little bit at length as to what has changed for royalty. As I mentioned, the earlier contract was done a decade ago. And uh, as the contract has expired and we have to sit and renegotiate contract with Unilever, and as they approached us to revisit the current contract, when you, when you end up entering in the contract, you have to then see what are the latest set of rates at which these contracts are done at arm's length in the industry. And, uh, and which is why independent benchmarking has been a very big input to what we end up agreeing as, as a rate going forward. And uh, I had captured when I spoke earlier that the uh, board commission uh, independent study by Big Four. Uh, and then the rates that we have now agreed uh, and the board has approved, uh, the cumulative impact of that, as I mentioned, for royalty, all, both components of trademark and technology put together is 1.95, and central services that you get from Unilever is 1.5. These rates, when bench, benchmarked, uh, they are extremely competitive. And uh, as uh, Sanjeev called out earlier, it, it's a public data in all the annual reports. Uh, the rates after increase also will be at the lower end uh, when we compare with the peers. So it's an extremely competitive set of range, rates, and more importantly, as a point we mentioned earlier, there is a cost which uh, gets incurred. But equally, there are benefits that we receive. And over the last one decade, the kind of benefits that we have received from Unilever and that we continue to get, be it the strong brands, uh, be it for that matter capability, and some examples I quoted of what benefit we're getting and how impact those are creating to our business, be it digital marketing, the example I was quoting on net revenue management, what Sanjeev mentioned about procurement global scale, when we add what we buy to 20 billion euro purchase that Unilever does globally, that's the scale advantage we get when we procure materials. 
and those expertise of commodity risk management, market expertise of understanding what's happening with commodity, those are the benefits we get from Unilever. Or for about the learning content, ESG on sustainability, massive amount of work happens in Unilever, and we leverage that work as we have driven our sustainability agenda in the country. Uh, today we are uh, rated one of the top in the country on ESG uh, metrics and a lot of learning and inputs have come from the learnings that we have got globally in the space of ESG and the way we drive it. So there are those associated benefits. So and ultimately, as I mentioned earlier, where does the cost sit? Royalty, all the C components, trademark, technology and central services, they all sit in the line of cost, overhead cost and other lines of the P&L outside material cost. And if you see this line, even for the earlier contract, which is, which is going to conclude by end of January and the results up to December quarter, over a period of time, our percentage cost to turnover has kept reducing and including the cost of royalty of 2.65 that we pay today, the total amount of other expenses that we have in our penal, they are at benchmark. They are lowest, uh, one of the lowest in the uh, industry in the country today. So that's the level of cost efficiency we've been also able to deliver because of those capabilities. So, so that's what ultimately justifies as to where we are in terms of the rates. And, uh, and these are the costs and investments uh, in our view which are genuinely required for us to keep doing the business and performing the way we have performed uh, over the last decade. And uh, we shall do the same over the next decades to come as well. Thank you, Ritesh. Uh, with that, uh, we now come to the end of this session. Uh, if there are any unanswered questions, please do reach out to any of us at Investor Relations. Before we end, let me again remind you that the playback of this event is available on the Investor Relations website uh, from a short while from now. Thank you and best wishes. Good, good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Hindustan Unilever Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you all for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.